um, on our identity. Well, my name is Bob DeBlore. I'm one of the pastors uh, here at Trinity. And as we get into this series, I just want to share with you something that happened to me a couple months ago. I was blessed to receive an incredible gift. Most of you probably don't know this about me, but one of the things I love to do is I love to bike, uh, to road bike, mountain bike, whatever. And just a couple months ago, uh, I was given a Trek Boone 9 gravel bike, and I've been having so much fun with it. As you can see, uh, this bike made its way to the Sioux Falls, uh, Falls Park, to that trail. I've ridden it around Orange City and Alton. I've taken it on vacation, and I'm expecting to use it a lot in the future as well. It's a wonderful bike. But also one of the things I love about this bike is I get the chance to tell people about what a great gift this, this has been. What a blessing that I uh, feel and experience in receiving a gift like this. And one of the things that we need to remember for each one of us who are gathered here today is that we've all been given a gift far greater than a Trek Boone 9 gravel bike. We've been given new life in Jesus Christ. It's a gift that's been offered to us, and God opens the door for all who would believe in him by faith, that gift. And so today we're in the midst of this core identity, these, this series that we're in, talking about what makes us as a church, what are the values that we have as a, as a believing body. And the first value that we talked about was being centered in the gospel. And we said that this is like the core of the core values, that all the values flow out of this one that the person and the work of Jesus Christ shapes all the other values. And we talked about that. We're going to hear more about that today. But then we went on to talk about how worship is a part. Biblical, vibrant worship is a part of who we are. And not just on Sunday mornings for an hour, but our lives are called to be lives of worship. After that, we talked about the, the value of growing in community. And what it means that we are to be a blessing to one another. And in this place of relationship, it's a place that we grow to be like Christ each and every day. Last week, Pastor Brian brought a message on on radical hospitality. And what it means that each of us are called to open up and make room in our lives for others as we go about this journey. Well, today it's a joy for me to bring the fifth value, which is missional engagement. And I wonder sometimes if if when we think about mission, we begin to think about it through the lens of, well, mission is just a part of the church. It's sometimes kind of that thing where, you know, it's seen as some people like mission, some people like this other thing. It's kind of for those who are into that sort of thing. Others of us might feel like mission is is, is all outward. It's, It's what we do in places like Africa or China or whatever. It's something that we support. But I believe that for us to understand this is a value, we, un- we need to understand that to be engaged missionally is, is part of the foundation and the fabric of each of our lives as God's people. In week number one, Pastor Brian said that because of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we are all invited to be on life with God, to be on mission with God. And so today, I hope and pray that we're going to explore together a couple different questions in this, pl- in this space. We're going to look at, well, what is this thing called missional engagement? We're going to look at how do we do this as, as individuals and as a congregation, and where is this lived out in our lives? So as we do this, let's come to the Lord God in prayer at this time. And gracious God, we thank you, Lord, that you desire for us to hear from you. Lord, that you invite us into having our hearts and our minds touched by your spirit, Lord, so that you are doing that work of changing us. Lord, would you move aside anything that would keep us from hearing from you today, and would you get praise and glory, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So the book of Romans is what we're going through as a church, and through the book of Romans, we see this beautiful picture of who Christ is, what the gospel is all about about his saving work and his including work into, for all of our lives into his plan of salvation. And as we've gone through the book, you also begin to read those themes of how this is made known, not just to the Jews, but it was made known to the Gentiles. And today, as you look at chapter 15, at the close of Romans, what Paul does is he begins the book by just celebrating the fact that God has included the Gentiles into faith. He's concluded us who are not Jews, And he calls us to be part of that work. 
And so listen to me with, with Paul as we hear from chapter 15, beginning at verse 14. It reads, I myself feel confident about you, my brothers and sisters, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct one another. Nevertheless, on some points, I've written to you rather boldly by a way of reminder because of the grace given me by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In Christ Jesus, then, I have reason to boast of my work for God, for I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to win obedience from the Gentiles by word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and as far around as Illyricum, I have fully proclaimed the good news of Christ. Thus I make it my ambition to proclaim the good news, not where Christ has already been named, so that I do not build on someone else's foundation, but as it is written, those who have never been told of him shall see. And those who have never heard of him shall understand. Friends, this is the word of God. Thanks be to God. So what does Paul teach us about what it means to be engaged missionally? Well, it's interesting if you think about what he's saying there at the beginning of this passage is he's pointing us to the, our role as a priest, a priestly ministry. And I don't know about you, but I, when I begin to think of that imagery, I begin to see a disconnect for many of us in that role. Here's a picture of a, of a priest, and, and, and automatically you begin to see something that's so far and separate from who we are, our lives, our experiences. Or we can feel like the duties that they have just are, are so distant from our own lives. Or maybe we're, we see the scandals that have happened in our, in our world, in the priesthood, and there's deep hurts and fears and wounds that happen. So it's important for us, if we have this priestly ministry, to understand, well, what is the role of a priest? Well, there's two main roles, I believe, that Paul is holding out for us. The first one is to act as a mediator for God. It's being a people who bring, a priest who bring the word of God to the people to make God known. And this is something he's called each one of us into as well. Listen to what Peter says. In chapter 2, verse 9, he says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people. And why, he says, In order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. We've been given the duty to make Christ known. We've been given this incredible gift of presenting Jesus Christ to a hurting world. And this is the greatest gift that we have. And what Paul does is he speaks of this work in, in terms of eagerness. There's like this an indebtedness that they've been trusted with something so great in order to let other people know of it. I want you for just a moment here to imagine yourselves that, that you're driving along a, a, a route and you see an accident ahead of you. You're the first one and the only one on the scene, and so as you go and you open the door to help the person, you begin to see that this person has something on their lap. I want to show you the picture of what's on this person's lap. It's this. It's a case. And the person communicates to you and says, this is an organ. It needs to get to the hospital because there's a surgery going on. This is important. And the way you respond, then, I believe, is, is, is a couple of different ways. You, first of all, you, receive with, you respond with a deep urgency. That this means life and death. This means there's a time frame that is given in this. But there's also a response of deep care, of saying, I need to get to that location to be able to bring that organ to its intended person, its recipient. But as you go along, I believe there's also a place of this sense of a deep honor and deep joy to know that you've been entrusted with this responsibility. And I believe that's really why and, and how we are to approach what God has called us to be about proclaiming him. That we have this incredible message of salvation. Paul says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of salvation for everyone who believes first for the Jew, then the Gentiles. He's saying this gift that we've been given, we've been entrusted with, is of such great value 
that it should cause within us a deep urgency to be able to share that, to be able to make that known. He begins also to understand that as we do that, we are entrusted with something so great that brings life and health to someone else, to the people that we bring it, that exhibits within us a, a deep joy and privilege to be part of that task. Well, there's a second role that the priest has in this passage, and that is to offer sacrifices to God. And we may wonder, on this side of the cross, what does that mean as Hebrews talks about that Jesus Christ is the, first and, the once and for all sacrifice for our sins? What does it mean that we offer sacrifices to God? 1 Peter 2, 5 says, Like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable, acceptable to God through Christ Jesus. And so Peter, again, he reminds us that we are called to give sacrifices, but what are they? Well, Paul in this letter in chapter 15 begins to tell us exactly what this is that we offer to God. Paul engages in mission so that the words that he speaks, that people then come to faith in Christ Jesus, that those whose lives have been turned from darkness to life, that those are the sacrifices that we give people who are now followers of Christ. People's lives that have been bought out of darkness. And what a pleasing aroma that is to the, to the very presence of our God to be offered that sacrifice. And we get to be part of that offering. What an incredible role we have in this. Well, Paul goes on in this passage to, to then go and speak about how we're engaged in this. And basically what he says to us is that we are involved in a powerful ministry. And I believe he says this because I think for all of us, as we think about the call to proclaim Christ, the call to, you know, offer sacrifices to God, most of us feel a, a real sense of inadequacy to the task. We ask ourselves, how could he use my life? Who am I that I can make Christ known? And maybe, we, maybe we're filled with all sorts of fears and, and doubts and all those kind of things. And then Paul says, but no, you've been called to a powerful ministry because you serve a powerful God. And that we can come forward and, and take those bold steps forward because it's not about us. It's about Christ in us. That's why Paul says in this passage, he says, is, I don't boast about anything except what Christ has accomplished in and through me. And as a Reformed Christian, then we can come and we can have that confidence in knowing that God has to go ahead of us, that we're not the ones that are going to change people's hearts and minds, but rather God's at work helping people to see their need for him, to be able to see the message that we give and to be able to respond. And so it gives us a much deeper boldness knowing that it's not all about us. But Paul in this passage says that there's some different ways that God works his powerful Holy Spirit in us. He says it's by word and deed, by signs and wonders. He begins to tell us that, that the word of God, that what we speak matters. And so important for us to understand that when we, we come to the word of God, it's not just for us to know it, but what God wants us to do is to reveal himself to us, to continue to change us so that we are, have a message to speak so we can use those words to speak into the hearts and lives of others. And Paul says this in Colossians chapter 4. He says, at the same time, pray for us as well that God will open the door for the word, that we may declare the mystery of Christ for which I am in prison, so that I may reveal it clearly as I should. So we pray, Lord, that, that God would use the words that we speak, but we also pray that God would open up hearts to hear from him. That God would open up a place that we can speak clearly. That there's nothing that would encumber the gospel message being shared with others. And we allow God to do that powerful work. But what Paul speaks about in this letter is that it's not just our words. He says it's in word and deed. In Colossians 4 or 5, he says, conduct yourselves wisely toward outsiders, making the most of the time. What Paul is basically saying is, if our words and our works don't match, then it's a confusing message. And a part of our life in Christ Jesus is allowing the Holy Spirit to continue to change us and transform us so that the way we live is experienced in this world. 
that the world sees that the joy that we have in Christ, that they see that we're no longer in bondage, but we are free, to see the, the kind of servant hearts that he's creating in us for the world. And when they see that, they begin to see not only who Christ is, but they see that they're included in God's plan of salvation. And so we are called to be a people that allow the Holy Spirit to lead us. If you think about the early church, the early church spoke the word of God, but what they were known for was that they went and they ministered to those who were hurting, those who were poor, those who were on the margins of society. And people could not doubt the, the very works that they demonstrated to say there's something different about these Christians. And I believe God then calls us to be about that, that same task, that we live out the gospel and we speak that gospel by the power of the Holy Spirit. But he goes on to say more than just words and deeds is that God is at work powerfully in signs and wonders. You know, sometimes in the technological age that we live in, sometimes we doubt that God is at work in miraculous ways. One of the things that I often you know, mourn is the fact that there's too many times where I may fail to see God's miraculous work around me. Whether I'm just too busy to see it, maybe I have doubts or fears or whatever, that I fail to see that God is at work. He's drawing people to faith. This past summer, I had the chance to uh, be praying for a lot of students who went around the world in different, in different uh, aspects to go to countries and, and uh, different kind of ministries through SOS and, and, and projects like that. Well, my son and, and a young man by the name of Devin Vanderwerf, uh, they had a chance to go to Greece, and so, of course, they were giving me reports about this. And, and this is their team in Greece. You can see Devin, he's the blonde hair. If you, he stood up, he's six seven. you wouldn't miss him. My son, he's like, where's Waldo? He's hiding back there somewhere. Um, but, what he, but what they shared with me was so beautiful because he said that there's these numerous people that came to faith in Christ Jesus after being you know, is Islamic all their life. And what he said to me is, it was such a beautiful thing, and I asked him the question, I said, well, was it because you were giving food and shelter and all those kind of things, was that why they were coming to faith? He said, well, that might be part of it, but actually, he said, what was so powerful was that these men and women were getting, receiving dreams in their countries, and they had no way to make sense of these dreams. And when they came from, from over to Greece and they, they interacted with the Christians, they would tell their dreams, and the Christians said, wait a second. And they'd open up the word of God, and they'd read the word of God where that dream, and that dream was almost exactly coming out of the word of God. And their hearts came alive. They said, this God of this universe is calling out to me and making himself known and calling me to faith in him. And I believe that God wants to work in miraculous ways. He wants to do that because then it's his glory. It's not about us. And we get to be part of that work in how that we be engaged missionally. Well, finally, I think what Paul shares in this passage is that this, this, uh, this work of being engaged missionally is really about all of us. It's really about a unique call on each of our lives. And so, in a sense, we're called to a pioneering ministry, something that's unique. Now, it's very easy, if you heard the passage this morning, it's easy to hear Paul's understanding of that pioneer work. He was called to go to places where the message had not been heard. If you look at this map behind me here, what you begin to see is that Paul was going to the places in this world that were the known world at his time. And he wanted to bring that message of Jesus Christ to all places as his particular unique calling. There's some of you who are here that maybe God is beginning to work in your hearts and calling you to go a place where the word of the Lord Jesus Christ, the knowledge of who he is, is not heard. There's a couple that were at the first service, Mark and Heather Teemersma, this is the couple. They graduated from Dort a couple years ago. This past year, we were able to support them as they did language training and culture training because they're feeling the call by God to go to places where Christ is not known. I asked Mark about this call, and, and he, read, he, he uh, gave me these words that I'm going to read to you right now and let you hear what he has to say. He says, Heather and I really love these verses from, Matthew, I mean, uh, from Romans chapter 4, 15. 
He says, because they show Paul's desire to see the gospel reach the farthest corners of the earth. He was even so bold as to say that his work from Jerusalem to Lyricum was completed. Paul, was doubtfully, Paul doubtfully was able to share the gospel with every single person in those areas. So how could he say his work was finished there? I believe this is because Paul planted churches in each of these areas, discipling the new converts in the scriptures and apostles' teachings so that they would be responsible for carrying the gospel to the lost people around them. That is why Paul could confidently say he was no longer needed. Not everyone can be of Paul. Apollos had a different role, for example. But Heather and I feel that we are young enough to learn new languages and live in tough locations. And we feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit to bring the gospel where Christ has not been named. There are many languages out there who have never heard, never had God's word taught in them. So we must offer ourselves up for this endeavor so that those who have never been told of him will see and those who have never heard of him will understand. You see, for Mark and Heather, these words of Scripture were so crucial to their calling to go to unreached people. <coughs> Excuse me. And of our whole heart's desire as a church is not that we just reshuffle the deck of Christians, but instead that our hearts would go to places where Jesus is not known. Or there's barriers that get in the way of, of really hearing the gospel message that we have to share. And each one of us is, is uniquely called to that task. We're not all called to, to leave and go to Nepal or to go to Chad or to go to places in this world where there's so few Christians, but each of us are called. In Romans chapter 12, Paul says, For as in one body we have many, many members, and not all the members have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ. And individually, we are members one of another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, <coughs> the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. Friends, we are called to discover the gifts that God has uniquely given to us. And from that calling, we are called to step out in faith with deep confidence and assurance that God goes with us. One of my favorite authors, John Stott, says, Christ calls different disciples to different tasks and endows them with different gifts in order to equip them. So we ask the question, don't we? What gifts has God given me? What, God, what gifts has God given you? And who are the people that God has put in your life? Who has God uniquely placed you in front of, of to, to make an impact? Or who is God calling you to step out in faith to say, I want to be in that place so that I have the opportunity to be used? <coughs> and finally, what a question is, what arenas has God placed you in? Where do you have impact? Where's your sphere, spheres of influence? My hope and prayer is, that, prayer is that each of us would look to those questions and begin to seek God and being in the places and responding to the call that God has given each one of us. Well, as we conclude, I, I just want to encourage you to hear those words from, uh, from Jesus again. Jesus says in, in, in John chapter 20, verse 21, As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And so where is God calling you? Where is he sending you? And this sending is not just an individual being sent. But I believe that one of the beautiful things about God's church and his plan, see, he sends us as a people. He sends us in community. And as a corporate body, as Trinity, we have been trying to, to, to discern where is God calling us? Where is he at work around us? Well, one of the ways that we are at work, you can hear at the beginning of the service, is, is in this unfolding process. I remember when I came here 10 years ago, the reason that I came to Trinity Church was that in the place that they were talking about what our heart was, they said there's 15,000 people, or 7,000 people in a 15 square mile radius that don't go to church, that don't respond in acts of faith. And I thought if this church wants to be about that, I would love to be part of that work. 
And today we get to be part of this unfolding work in Hospers. But we have to keep reminding ourselves this isn't just about the church there, but it's about the 900 to 1,000 people in Hospers and around there that don't know Christ Jesus. And maybe some of you that today are, are, are sensing that call as we begin this work, that maybe God's calling you to, to participate in that work in some way. For others of you, you know, one of the things that I, we see in our community is how can we bring those who are Anglo and Latinos together? What does that look like for us to be the gospel bearers together? And so we had a meal together last week. We're going to do a soccer clinic coming up. But all in all, all those kind of things are really geared toward how can we build relationships so that the gospel can go forward between two cultures. So maybe God's calling some of you to be part of our Conexionist ministry or in different ways in our community. I believe that for every one of us, that God would begin to have us think about the place that we are, that our neighborhoods, our dorms, our apartments, wherever God has called us to be, and he's calling us to begin to ask God, what does it look like for me to live missionally in the place that God has called me to be at this time, in this place? And we get to be engaged missionally for God's purposes. Well, Paul began the passage that we read today with these words. He says, Nevertheless, on some points I've written to you rather boldly by way of reminder because of the grace that was given to me by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus. Each of us is called to be that minister, to be that priestly function, to be that person engaged in mission. But Paul is reminding them that this is so. And I believe that each of us need those reminders, don't we? We so quickly can get caught up in all the things of the world, get so quickly caught up in the, in the things of life that we, we lose out on the fact that God has called us to this unique opportunity and opportunities to live for him on mission. That's why John Piper says we are to preach the gospel to us daily. I believe it's because we need to hear the gospel message so clearly to us that we understand that we were apart from Christ. We were in darkness, but because of Jesus Christ, he has forgiven us, he has set us free, and he has given us new life. And that message was a matter of life and death. And he's called me into his glorious life, into his glorious light, so that others would also hear that message and respond we need to be about the gospel. It is the power of salvation for all who believe. We need to allow that gospel to penetrate our hearts and lives so deeply that we cannot help but desire and be obedient to bring it forward. God saves us in Christ Jesus, and God sends us out. He sends us out to our neighborhoods, to our workplaces, our dorms, the places we eat and we shop, he sends us out to be engaged in mission of making disciples wherever we find ourselves, wherever God sends us. Let's be about that task. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you that you, that you choose to use our lives for your purposes. Lord, you know the confusions that we feel sometimes and the unworthiness that we feel to that task and so we, may we be people, Lord, that continue to look to you. Lord, for you to, to have our hearts and our lives come alive, Lord, with the gospel in us. That it be a burning passion, Lord, for us within us that we cannot hold on to. But Lord, we need to share who you are and what you, meant, you mean to us. Lord, because we love the people that you've put in our path. We so desire them for to, them to experience your grace and your goodness. And so lead us, we pray. And help us, Lord, to know that you're doing this work not only here, but, Lord, that we are part of your, your kingdom work throughout the whole world. That we are gathered with fellow believers from all tongues and nations and tribes, Lord. That we get to celebrate the Lamb who's seated at the throne. Lord, the one who is our salvation. So be with us now, Lord, as we come to your table. Help us, Lord, to, to seek your face and allow your grace, Lord, to fill us again. And we pray this in Jesus' name.